So it's been four weeks um, since we've been in this series, and um, I can be honest, right, about today. Like, um, that intro video to the sermon series, um, I'm an inside dog, so I don't do the outdoors very much. Uh, I'm more inside. I'm just, I have trouble connecting with that video. I'm like, how is that pure? Are the outdoors pure? Is that what that's getting at? I said, I'm not out there much, but I like the inside and hotels, not the woods, but, uh, but that's okay. And I'm so sorry I just shared that with you. If you're a guest here today, I'm a guest pastor. I'm not the pastor here. Uh, my name is Jim, and uh, I'm from Trustful. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, sometimes what I'm thinking comes out of my mouth, and sometimes I'm holding a microphone, and uh, that's okay. But no, my name is Pat, and I am the campus pastor here in Pell City, and sometimes I just like to share what's going on in my life, and uh, that's appropriate for today as we're launching life groups, uh, which is a good thing, and uh, excited you're here and a part of it. If you're a guest with us here for the first time today, I want to say welcome home. It's good to have you with us. Uh, if it's your first time back in a long time, we just want to say welcome back. It's good to see you. We're glad you're here, and everybody else just calls this place home on a regular basis. It is wonderful to see your faces today. And so, as I said, we are in week number four of this series that we're calling Pure. And as we've been talking about what it is to be pure and what purity is all about, it's very easy for us when we think about being pure, it's very easy for us to think that we have to get it right all the time, that we can't mess up anymore, that we can't uh, ever stumble again, and, and we've got to get it right all the time so that God likes us and blesses us, and at least that's the places I would go in my life when I had these thoughts about what it is to be pure and what purity is, and, and I just want to say, purity does not begin with you exhausting yourself on the hamster wheel of spiritual checklist, trying to please God. Like, that is not purity. You're just going to exhaust yourself, wear yourself out, and then following Jesus will not be a joy. It will be a burden to you, and it will be a chore. And that is not the way that Jesus wants us to live. Following Jesus is not a burden. It is the greatest thing that we could ever do. And so I want us to begin to think of purity in a new perspective and, and to have a new perspective. That purity isn't so much about us doing this or not doing that, but purity begins in us trusting what Jesus has already done for us. This is where our purity lies. And when we trust Jesus where we are, with what we're carrying, with even who we are, when we look in, the, look in the mirror and what we see is who we are, even if we trust Jesus in that moment, that's when purity can begin to blossom inside of us. Because here's what I've discovered in my life, in my relationship with Jesus, that when I truly trust Jesus, then I'm more apt to follow his way. And then doing the things that he wants me to do and loving the people he wants me to, to, to love them like, that becomes something that's natural and a joy as opposed to something I'm trying to do to get God to give me more favor or like me more. So, so purity, it begins with this perspective and ends with the perspective of trusting Jesus where we are. It's believing this perspective that you are who Jesus says you are as opposed to believing you are just the sum of the things that you've done or that you've left undone. Purity begins by believing you are who Jesus says you are regardless of what's transpired in your life. And you are beloved and you are valued and you are worthy and you are part of a family. This is who Jesus says you are, and this is where our purity begins. And so I want to invite you to step into that perspective. And then following Jesus becomes more of a joy as opposed to a burden. And so we've been saying that, that being pure is about believing the new perspective, seeing and embracing who Jesus says you are. Now today I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to add something to what I just said. Purity begins by seeing and embracing who Jesus says we are, but it's not just about us in this thing that we call Christianity. It's always about community. It always is. So, so being pure is not just about seeing and embracing what Jesus believes about us, but it's also seeing and embracing what Jesus believes about others around us. That if he truly loves others the way that he loves you, then that should change our perspective of the people that are around us. And that if Jesus values people around us, what do you think we should do as followers of his? We should value people around us. If he loves people around us, then we should love people around us. After all, he has commanded us in John 13, 34, this should be familiar to those of you that attend our campus uh, often. Jesus gives us this new command, one thing we have to do, and this is it, love each other. 
John 13, 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. How do we love each other? Jesus says, just in the same way that I have loved you. So you should love each other. This is what we are to be about, loving one another the way that Jesus has loved us. And if purity is going to be a part of our life, our perspective of others really has to change. If Jesus loves and values them, then we must become a people who love and value them as well. I truly believe this. The way we view and treat others really is a direct reflection of how much we trust Jesus. That's what I think. How we view and treat others even especially the ones we disagree with and maybe don't like that much. How we view and treat even them really is a direct reflection of how much we really trust Jesus and how much we are following his way. And so purity is about embracing who Jesus says you are, but it's also believing and embracing who Jesus says others are. And so that's where we're going today. And so we've talked in this series about some pretty big topics. We talked about guilt. We talked about shame. We've talked about addiction, things that keep us from being pure and trusting Jesus. And when we handle those things, guilt, shame, and addiction, we like to close them up and handle them on our own instead of trust Jesus. And that just kind of slides us farther away from life and truth. And we've talked about how to overcome some of those things. And and today, um, as we talk about learning to love others and value others the way that Jesus does, today's topic is a big one. And it's this, it is forgiveness. Today, we're going to talk about forgiveness, and I want to say central to the heart and the core of Christianity is this idea of forgiveness. Without forgiveness, Christianity is not Christianity. It's not. And so this idea of forgiveness, it's one of the centerpieces of our faith, not just in what we receive from God, but how our disposition is towards others around us, even those who have wronged us or hurt us. Forgiveness is the centerpiece of who we are as, as, as people of God, as followers of Jesus. And forgiveness is big because forgiveness deals with our past. It's dealt with in the present. And you know this, based on how you handle forgiveness, it's going to mess with your future. It will. And so we've got to get a healthy handle on forgiveness and learn to be a people that forgive as we have been forgiven. Easier said than done, right? But nonetheless, not an excuse to not do it. And so today we're going to talk about forgiveness and and what this is. And and so it can be sticky to talk about because as we talk about forgiveness today, things are going to come to your mind, things that are hard to deal with, things you've pushed down, things you haven't talked about uh, in a long time, things we're afraid to deal with. But these things need to come to the surface if we want freedom in life to the full. And so we're going to tackle forgiveness. And if there's one thing I know about forgiveness, from our perspective, we love forgiveness, especially when we are the people that are being forgiven. Right? Yep. We, we love forgiveness when our boss forgives us or uh, the police officer lets us off with a warning or our family member or friend forgives us. Like, like we love that. Right? We love that forgiveness. We want it. And it's a wonderful thing. Right? And, and we love when God forgives us. Right? Like we love when God forgives us, forgives us. A verse we've been talking about a lot is 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us or purify us of all unrighteousness. God is always ready to forgive. Always. And you may say, well, Pat, what if I am forgiven and then I do the same thing over and over again? First off, welcome to humanity. Second off, if I continue to do that, will God forgive me? No, I'm just kidding. Of course he will forgive you. Just checking to see if you're awake this morning. Of course God will forgive you. Why will God forgive? Because that is who God is. He is a good father. Right? And and how do we know that God is good? We see it expressed through his son, Jesus, and the fullest revelation of who God is and how he feels about humanity is Jesus upon the cross, taking upon himself the power of sin and death and overcoming it because we could not on our own. And he offers that to us freely. That's how God feels about humanity. He went to great, the greatest lengths he could go to so that we could be free and we could find forgiveness. And so God will always forgive. His forgiveness isn't based on our faithfulness, but his faithfulness towards us. And that is a good thing. And so here's what this means. God's forgiveness is inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. There is no end 
to the forgiveness that God will bring to us. And because that is reality today, I want to encourage you with this. If God's forgiveness is inexhaustible, then it's okay for you today. Stop running from him. Stop trying to hide things from him. He ain't mad at you. He's not angry at you. He wants you to stop and turn to him so that you find life to the full. This is what he wants for us. Not to heap upon us this great list of things that now we have to do that burden us even more. That's not what pure is all about. He wants us to stop running and find him because this is where life is. And this is where family is. And this is where the fullness of life resides is with God himself. So forgiveness is ever present to us and it's wonderful from God to us. But there's a deeper dive we have to take into forgiveness to get I don't want to say the full effect, but the full effect of what forgiveness really can do in the life of a follower of Jesus. And so I want to take you to Matthew chapter 6. And Matthew chapter 6 falls square in the center of three chapters of the greatest sermon that was ever given. Uh, It's said not just by, of course, Christians, but even those outside of Christianity. Gandhi called it the the ethical backbone uh, of Christianity, right? The Sermon on the Mount given by Jesus in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. I encourage you, read it, learn it. And you see it's called the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. Like it is this beautiful, beautiful sermon that Jesus gives. And it begins with the Beatitudes. We did a series on that not too long ago. But uh, in, this, in this Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, the disciples asked Jesus a very good question. Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus responds by saying, when you pray, this is how you should pray. And it's called the what? Does anybody know? It's called the Lord's Prayer. If you don't know it, that's okay. We're going to go over it in just a second, right? And The Lord's Prayer is something very powerful. Here's what I believe. The Lord's Prayer is not a formula that we are to design around. I think we are to pray the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus says, pray this, like, we should pray it. And I want to say, in my life, most every day of my life, I pray the Lord's Prayer when I start off my day. And you may be saying, Pat, does that get old? It does not get old. The Lord's Prayer does not get old because the Lord's Prayer, as I pray it, I'm formed by it. And it makes me mindful of things when I hear words and hear phrases. And those phrases and words form me to think of different things as I pray the prayer. And some of you may say, well, praying the same thing over and over, like that's just dead to do that over and over. No, no. The Lord's Prayer is true. Whether it has life or not depends on us. All right? And so I I think we should pray it every day of our lives. And I encourage you to make this a part of your life. And I say this often about prayer. Prayer is not just trying to get God to do the things we think God ought to be doing. The purpose of prayer is to form us so that we are shaped and we are mindful of God as we go about our day, when we are talking to him or when we are listening to him. We are reading scripture or the Lord's Prayer or whatever. We are formed by this so that we are shaped to work in advance and make it on earth as it is in heaven. And so when I pray the Lord's Prayer, it reminds me I'm part of an unstoppable kingdom, that I am not alone. I am a part of community, that the Lord provides. There is direction. There is a goal. There is a purpose to this thing called life, and God is with me, and and I'm not alone. That's one of the most important things. Pat, how does the Lord's Prayer tell you that you're not alone? What's the first word of the Lord's Prayer? Our. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you join a community of faith. Our, a group, plural, people, right? We join with those voices from the past, the present, and even in the future when they pray this prayer, when we're long gone, they will join that community of faith and they will pray our Father. It lets us know that we are not alone. It's more than me. Community matters. And so as we are in a community of faith, how we are to one another matters. And Jesus actually gets at this idea of community and what can keep it together as forgiveness kind of forms the centerpiece, so to speak, of this prayer. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, and I want us to do this together. I want us to say this together out loud, right? Let's start with the word hour. You ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that's where it ends. Now, I know some of you that know this prayer are probably thinking, Pat, that's not where it ends. What is the sorcery you speak of? Because normally there's another line at the end, right? And what is that line? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever, right? Well, in some of the earliest manuscripts, uh, that line wasn't in there. It was added a little later. I hope that doesn't upset your apple cart. It shouldn't. It's true that his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's absolutely true. And I encourage you, read the footnotes in your Bible, right? You see the tiny little A, B, C, or D after a word. It tells you go to the bottom of the page and see what it's talking about there. You'll learn a lot. That's neither here nor there. That's just free Bible helps for you today. Uh, you're welcome. Um, but in the center of this prayer is something very important. And we see debts, as we have also forgiven those who uh, debts, whatever it is. You've also heard it this way, forgive us our sins and trespasses as we also have forgiven those who sin and trespass against us, right? Father, forgive us, we love that, right? But tied to it is as we also have forgiven people that have wounded us and hurt us. Lord, forgive us is easy, but us forgive others. How many of you would agree that can be difficult sometimes? based on what has happened. Jesus placed a special emphasis in the Lord's prayer on forgiveness. And then what's interesting, as soon as the prayer ends in verse 12, in verse 13, he immediately goes back. In verse 13, it ends. Verse 14 immediately goes back and talks about forgiveness again. Now, this is going to sound shocking when I read it, all right? And it's going to go against some of the things that you've you've thought, but I want you to bear with me. We'll walk through it together. You can take a deep breath in and out. It's going to be okay, all right? Verse 14. For if you forgive men, people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's shocking to me anyway. And that doesn't feel like it jives with everything I know about the cross and, and, and Jesus and I'm forgiven and all of this stuff. But I want to explain what's happening here and give you the idea of what, what's going on. And so verses 14 and 15, they have conditional statements. If you, then I. You understand these kinds of statements very well. If you are a parent... You understand conditional statements very well, don't you, right? If you clean your room, then I will take you to GameStop. That's my life, okay? That's the bribery I use, right? If you clean your room, then I will take you to GameStop, and you can trade in a game and and all this. Like, that's my life. If you eat your dinner, then I will get you ice cream, right? Those are statements that we like to use with our children. Now, pay attention. When we give conditional statements like this, if your children fail to follow the command, it does not mean they're not your children anymore, does it? It doesn't mean that you don't love them anymore. Here's what it means. It just means they don't get to experience the degree of generosity and freedom you are offering them because they refuse to follow your command. That's what it says. It doesn't mean you're not your children. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means they don't experience the freedom and the generosity that's available to them because they're not trusting what you're asking them to do. This is the heart of what Jesus is getting at when he says these words. Because we refuse to forgive people who have wounded us, we shut ourselves off from the freedom and the life that we could experience that's already available to us from God. And so that's why Jesus comes back to this, because he understands the relationships we have with one another can either push us towards freedom or take it away. And we, even if someone wounds us, we have the power in our hands to continue to walk in freedom. And the key to walking in freedom is forgiveness, right? It is Forgiveness, to withhold forgiveness from a person that has hurt you or or someone around you, to withhold forgiveness from them, probably doesn't hurt them as much as it hurts you. 
because it weighs you down and it keeps you stuck in that circumstance and situation and you are shut off from the goodness of God. Not because God isn't good, he's opened the door for you to have freedom in life and he'll never force you to do anything, he invites you to a better way. And forgiveness is the key that really gets us through into that freedom and life that we want, right? When we refuse to forgive someone else, it's not that God, it's not that we're not forgiven by God anymore because Jesus on the cross tells us once and for all we are forgiven, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely right. Jesus uttered three words over the sin that separated us from God, right? It is now what? Finished. It's done. 2 Corinthians 5 tells me that through the work of Christ, we are reconciled back to God. This is who we are, but when we pull away from forgiveness and community with others, we shut ourselves off from the flow of freedom and life that comes from God. We do that by refusing to follow the command of Jesus. Forgiveness is big. It is the gauge that determines the freedom that we walk in. Forgiveness. And so it tells us that our followers of Jesus, forgiveness, forgiveness is not an option. Forgiveness is an obligation. We are obligated to forgive. Why? Because we have been forgiven much. We are obligated to love because we have been loved much. God freely gives, and then we should turn and freely give in whatever it is. But this can be tough for us because we say, you don't know what they've done. You know what they said. You don't know how they hurt me. I just want to say this about forgiveness. When you forgive someone, it doesn't mean you have to be besties with them. It doesn't mean you have to go to dinner with them. It doesn't. It just means that when you offer forgiveness and you truly offer it to them, it just opens up the valve of freedom for your life. And it helps you to overcome those things that have kept you down for so long. We must forgive as we have been forgiven. Jesus goes on later on in the book of Matthew to talk in greater degrees and teach more about forgiveness because he understands, as we all understand, as human beings, we have a tough time sometimes loving each other well. And forgiving as we have been forgiven. So Peter asked Jesus a really good question, I think, because he senses there's something a little different about the kingdom of God that Jesus has brought to the earth. And in Matthew 18, 21, it says, Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? That sounds kind of weak to us because we don't understand. But the law of the day said this. If someone sins against you three times, you're only obligated to forgive him three times. And so Peter's like, boom, I'm a superstar. I'm up in the ante. Jesus, I'm going to forgive somebody it's like seven times. Like, that's really good. Peter's feeling good. He's just confessed Jesus is the Christ. He got a blessed are you, Simon. He's gunning for another one here, it feels like. But then Jesus turns around, and he ups the ante even more. Jesus says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. You put one number of what you think is the cap, the limit. I'm going to add the complete same number to it so that you understand whatever you think is the most, double it. Double it. And then also in the number system, in, in the Bible, seven represents wholeness or perfection, or completeness. So if in Peter's mind, seven is the perfect number, Jesus says, no, 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 double perfection, limitless, right? There is no cap to forgiveness. What Jesus is saying is this, if God's forgiveness is inexhaustible, then our forgiveness should be inexhaustible. That's what he's getting at. That's what he's teaching. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on, but wait, there's more. He goes on, and he gives this teaching, this parable. Now, let me tell you what a parable is. A parable is a completely made-up fictional fable or tale to convey a moral truth, to teach and to make a point. And so we can't 
make 100% just based off the surface and say it's exactly what's happening there. But Jesus makes up this story to teach us something powerful about forgiveness. And in verse 23, he tells the story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, or it should be, in the place where God rules, this is how it should be, right? On earth as it is in heaven, this is how it should be. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, a talent is not an amount of money. A talent was a measurement of weight. And in their times, one talent equaled 75 pounds. And so, do the math, 10,000 talents was, my wife knows this, math teacher, 750,000 pounds. Now, just to give you some perspective on what the debt is. This is not true of the first century. You can't translate this back. I'll put it into modern terms so that we just can wrap our heads around. This was an insurmountable debt, all right? On Friday, gold was selling for $1,900 an ounce, all right? And gold is measured for some reason. 12 ounces is considered a pound of gold. And so when you do all of that math, here's what it comes out to, this number here. 17 trillion, you go ahead and put that number up, 17 trillion, 100 billion dollars. So, again, that's not the amount that they're talking about in the New Testament, but I make that point to let us know that this is an unpayable debt. And we're talking about a servant of a king, so it's very unlikely that he's going to hit the lottery anytime soon. And so, what does the king do with the servant? He ordered that he, the servant, his wife and children be sold, separated from him. But the man fell to his knees and begged and pleaded for mercy. And in verse 27, the master took mercy or pity upon him, canceled all of his debt, and let him go free, right? Let him go free. And so, you could say that this is a really cool parable, right? The master is God. The servant could be us. The debt could be sin, and the wages of our sin is death, and it separates us from God. But God is good, and that he, he, he takes that away so that we can be reconciled to him, right? The things that shatter relationships and break up communities, right? God has made a way for that to be forgiven, and we don't have to do anything to earn it, Right? beautiful. God forgives freely. But Jesus has more to say about forgiveness. In verse 28, then the man who had the unpayable debt that was forgiven of everything goes and finds another person that owed him some money, that owed him just a hundred denarii. Can you guys believe that? Over a hundred denarii? You don't know what a denarii is, but I'll tell you. One single denarii was equal to one day's wage. And so 100 denarii was how many days' wage? Like 100. You didn't think you'd have to do word problems today, right? 100 denarii. So, so basically, it, just to give us some idea, a third of a year's salary, if you make $45,000 a year, a third of that would be what? Very good, class. $15,000. Now, I'm going to say fifteen grand is a lot to me. Like, that's a lot. But when you compare fifteen grand to $17 trillion, we're talking apples and oranges here, Right? You can work, right, to get 15 grand. That's doable, but the person that was forgiven of 17 trillion, so to speak, takes the guy that just owes him a few dollars, chokes him, screams at him, throws him in jail until he can pay him back. Turd move, right? Just bad. And so word gets back to the king who had forgiven this guy of all of this unpayable debt. Then the master called the servant in who owed so much. You wicked servant, I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Shouldn't he have? Of course he should have. So what happens? Again, this is a parable. In his anger, the master turned him over to the jailers, threw him in jail to be tortured, until he could pay back all that he owed. Could he pay that back? Probably not. He was jailed and tortured until he could pay it back, which was never. 
And then another shocking statement from Jesus to make his point about how important forgiveness is. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, we can't take this literally because God's not going to throw you in jail if you refuse to forgive someone. He's not going to cease loving you. But Jesus' point is clear and strong. When we refuse to forgive, we cease from experiencing life to the full. And it is not God's fault that we cease to experience life and freedom to the full. It is our own. We put ourselves in jail. We shut off the valve because we refuse to forgive from our hearts. You see, here's how I want you to think about forgiveness. Forgiveness equals freedom. Freedom. And it's not just about receiving forgiveness that brings us freedom. It's also about giving it to others as we have been given it that gives us freedom. Noted theologian and scholar, and my personal fave, by the way, N.T. Wright, says this about forgiveness. I love this so much. He says, forgiveness isn't like a Christmas present always waiting to be opened, but rather forgiveness is like air in our lungs. It is oxygen and life to a follower of Jesus. It is what we breathe in for life, but in order to breathe more in, we have to breathe some out. And the only way to take more oxygen into the lungs is to exhale what's inside. And so if we want to be nourished and we want to have life, We not only have to breathe in forgiveness, we have to breathe it out. And if we want more life, we have to breathe it in and we have to breathe it out. To keep it for ourselves and to refuse to exhale is is to not only deny ourselves freedom and life, but potentially keep someone else from experiencing it too. And so forgiveness is like air to our lungs. Breathe it in and breathe it out. And when it comes to forgiveness... We focus usually on the wrong things, what's been done to us. And when that's the only focus, we can then justify why we'll never give forgiveness, right? They don't deserve it. And here's what I would say. In a lot of cases, you're probably right. They don't deserve it. And there's been a lot of times, I bet, in your life and my life, we didn't deserve it either. And I want to say, forgiveness can't hinge on deservedness. Forgiveness hinges on love. Not just our conception of love, but the love that Jesus has given to us. We must love as we have been loved, forgive as we have been forgiven. Breathe it in and breathe it out. How much forgiveness someone deserves is no longer the question. Here's the question. How much freedom do you really desire? How much do you desire? The degree that you forgive others will be the degree you experience freedom. That choice is completely yours. You can stay miserable all that you want, or you can trust Jesus, follow his way. And I think you're going to find it's less burdensome than you could have ever imagined. Just forgiving someone can bring fresh air into your lungs. It can be new life. Holding it in eats you alive. And so I want to say two things about forgiveness as we get ready to close. Forgiveness is an act. Like it is a physical act that must transpire. Of course it starts in our heart. But then we must take the step and tell the person, I forgive you. But here's what I know. When we see them again, or we think about it again, the feelings are going to come back, aren't they? Over and over. And so forgiveness isn't just an act, it also has to be an attitude. And we must forgive and forgive and forgive, sometimes every single day until we're no longer triggered by their presence. (sighs) Breathe it in and breathe it out. This is... I think, my opinion, what Jesus is getting at is an attitude. This is a way of life. And if we want freedom, forgiveness must be there. 
Deservedness is not what it hinges on, love. I'll close with this scripture. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with each other. And forgive, what's the next word? Whatever. Whatever. I don't care. Whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave. But Pat, you don't know. That's not the point. If you want to be free, forgive. If you want to be owned, withhold forgiveness. The choice is yours. God will not force you to do anything. That's why being pure is about trusting Jesus and trusting his way. It's that simple today. Forgive as you have been forgiven. I want to invite us to pray today and maybe you could think of a person or some people that you have harbored some things against for quite a long time. I want you to think if there's a person in your life that has just wounded you or hurt you or someone you love and you've been carrying it. Just close your eyes and think of that. And maybe today, you could trust Jesus where you are. And and trusting Jesus today looks like this, forgiving that person. But Pat, I don't want to forgive them. You probably don't. But I want to challenge you to step out on faith, trust the way of Jesus, and it will lead you to freedom. Commit the act of forgiveness and then adopt that attitude into your life. I forgive them. I forgive them. Today, say those words right where you are. I forgive. And then say the person's name. Say it. So that it doesn't own you anymore. Forgiveness. Take the step and trust Jesus. And as you're saying that name in your heart and forgiveness with it, now commit. I'm going to take the next step and I'm going to tell them in person. And if it's an unsafe situation, take someone with you. Call on the phone, but take a step. Deservedness is not in play here. But how much life and freedom do we want?